It's a joy to be back with you again. I look forward to this time in the Word with you. A story, an instructive story was told of a man by the name of Jack Bennett. He's a very successful man. He became very busy in his career and his career and his business dominated his time. He had no time for his family, no time for the things that are important in his life. One day, his mother called him and said, Jack, I have bad news for you. Our neighbor, Uncle Harold Blesser, has passed away. Now, Uncle Harold was a neighbor that Jack grew up with. And when Jack was a little boy, he would go to Uncle uh, Harold's house to play. And they would spend many an afternoons together. And Jack was um, endearing himself to Uncle Harold, and Hank, Uncle Harold loved Jack. So the little boy and the old man would spend a lot of time together. And Jack was always very curious because at the study desk, he found there was a box and it was always locked. And so he came and asked Uncle Jack, what's inside the box? And Uncle Jack says, it's the thing that is most valuable to me. So he asked Uncle Jack, what is it that is most valuable to you? What is in the box? I want to see it. And Uncle Jack will smile and say, no, it is something that is only to me and is very precious. So at the funeral, it was an uneventful event. Uh, Jack had very little um, relatives and most of his friends has passed on. And after the funeral, Jack's, um, sorry, um, Jack's mother, sorry, Jack's mother and him went to Uncle Harold's house. And the old furnitures were there. The house had not changed for the decades. And Jack went to look for the box. And then he turned to the mother and said, it's missing, it's gone. What's gone, son? The box, the box. The box that has what is most precious and valuable to Uncle Harold. They couldn't find it. Maybe a relative had taken it, he thought. A few days later, by special delivery, Jack Bennett received a parcel. He opened it and it was the box and together the parcel was the key so he took the key opened up the box because finally he's going to find what is valuable to uncle harold he opened up the box and there was a golden pocket watch he took that watch he opened up the cover And there inscribed were these words. Jack, thank you for our time. Love, Harold, bless her. Jack started to cry. He realized now that the most precious thing to Uncle Jack was time. More particularly, the time the old man and the young boy spend together. Thank you for our time. My friends, one of the most important things we must learn in life, in discipleship and leadership, is that our time is a gift from God. Our life is determined by our time. And so our life and our time is a gift from God. What we make of our life and our time is our gift back to God. We've got to learn to live an intentional life. That's the question I want to explore with you this morning. How then shall we live? And the answer, we must live with purpose and intentionality. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 18, we find four key principles of how to live an intentional life so that we can live it with purpose and meaning. Would you bow with me in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless this time together? 
Heavenly Father, I pray once again that the words of the Scriptures might speak to us afresh to give us wisdom in how we live our life in the light of the time you have given to us. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Four key principles of how to live an intentional life. Principle number one, examining your life. In Ephesians chapter 5, it reads in verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. It says, be careful how you walk. The word walk in the Greek is peripateo, and is used as a figure of speech on the direction of our life and the conduct of our lives. How you walk is basically how you live your life in terms of your conduct and the direction of your life. We've got to live it intentionally. It says be careful. In other words, pay attention. And there are three things I want to highlight for you in this simple phrase, be careful how you walk. The first, we have to be attentive to the direction of our life. Where is your life headed? It is no use pursuing success without living with a sense of purpose, meaning, and significance. We must move from a pursuit of success to live a life that is significant. Because God calls us to live a life that is in Christ, that has meaning and purpose. Be careful how you walk. Pay attention to the trajectory of your life, to the direction by which your life is guided unto. In other words, in a simple question, what are you living for? What are you really living for? What are you exchanging your life for? What are you exchanging your time for? Be careful how you walk. I told my congregation in Singapore, don't sudoku your life away. Today, I have to tell them, don't Korean drama your life away. <laughs> don't go and waste your life when it's not directed in things that will help you, bless you, strengthen you and direct your life towards purpose and meaning. Pay attention to the direction of your life. The second understanding is we got to pay attention because it's something important. We have to be careful how we walk. I'll give you an example. Suppose you go to Vietnam out in the open field and you are strolling in that field and suddenly someone shouts at you and you turn around to find out why this guy is shouting and he says to you, stop! And you stop and he says, be careful! Because you realize you have wandered into a minefield. What would you do? You will be very careful how you walk in that minefield. You will not mindlessly meander or stir around in a minefield. Be careful how you walk. Pay attention to the steps that you take because it's important we can be derailed if we are not careful in how we guide our steps. The third thing to pay attention to is to realize that we have to be sensitive to whether we are paying attention or we are not paying attention to the things that are important. Because sometimes our attention can be distracted. And what we should pay attention to, we don't. And so when he says be careful, the Greek word is akribos. It, it means uh, to be sensitive to, to be pay direct attention to, to make a judgment call to be careful. It can be translated, walk accurately, meticulously, conscientiously. Be careful 
how you walk. Let me apply this for us. My beloved friends, do not take your time or your life for granted. Because we have only one crack at the bat, as it were, only one life to live. We don't have two, three lives or a hundred lives to live. Only one life. And what is past is already gone. So we have to be careful how we steward this life that God is giving. What are we living for? Don't take life for granted. In a movie called Dead Poet Society, there was a school teacher by the name of Mr. Kittings. He took his young charges, his students, and he gathered, around, uh, gathered them around in the hall where there were pictures of these uh, old-timers who were previous students of the school, black and white photographs of years gone by. And he got the students to lean closer to look at these old black and white photographs of students in previous years, but now they, they have already passed on. A previous generation. And Mr. Kittings walked behind his students as they, he asked them to lean in to look at the photographs. And then he whispered these words to them, Kappa Diem. Kappa Diem. Seize the day. He wanted to impress upon these young students the understanding how precious time is. Seize the day, carpe diem, because like these old photographs, they are students now, they are boys now, but their lives were flashed by and it would be gone. Seize the day. Don't take life for granted. Capture your time, invest your time, steward your time. I give you two practical ideas I found helpful as a pastor, as a leader. And it will help you in the ministry, it will help you in your discipleship, it will help you in your walk. And especially for those of you who are leaders, pay attention to these two things because I found they are very important in the management of time, particularly for leaders. The first thing to pay attention to is a think time. No matter how busy I keep a four-hour think time each week. One hour to read, two hours, the reading is to prime the pump, to set me thinking, two hours to reflect, and one hour to journal, to write down that which I read. I have found that this think time, there are 168 hours a week. To put four hours out of the 168 hours is not too difficult. And this thing time is very valuable because it keeps my thoughts sharp. It helped me to be a reflective practitioner. Keep a think time. Start with one hour, two hours, but take time by which to reflect. Take time by which to journal. By the way, I keep three journals. The first journal is what I originally called the rubbish journal. Now I call it random thoughts because rubbish journal sounds terrible. But the idea behind the first journal is I, it's a mental dump. Anything that is in my mind, any idea, I just throw into this random thoughts journal. The second journal I keep is a processing journal. I travel with it and I write down my thoughts as I process my reflection. They become more refined as I reflect and I write through these thoughts during that think time. And then I come uh, to the third journal, which is the product, the teaching journal. The things I reflected on, I put them in paradigms, mentoring paradigms, and, and out comes the, the paradigms of thought. My point is somewhere down our life, to live it meaningfully, make time to think. An unexamined life is not worth living. Make time to think. Make time to reflect. Make time to ask the deep questions of life. And look at it biblically. Look at it theologically. And allow the Lord to guide you in your thoughts in how you live your life. 
The second application that is helpful for me is to keep a buffer time. So the first is a think time, the second is a buffer time. What is the buffer time? I do not put my engagements back to back and pack them in in a compressed, busy schedule. Within the schedule, there is enough buffer time. Enough time for a pit stop, for a break. Enough time to engage in deep, unhurried conversations. Enough time for myself in terms of the think time. These are buffer times because it allows that space in our life for us to grow. Keep a buffer time. I, I tell senior leaders, in, in your week, don't pack all your meetings together. Keep at least 10% of your time, especially for senior leaders, where your nose is taken out of, a two, you cannot be too close to the ground. You must take a step back and survey the larger picture. But whatever you do, live your life intentionally, live it reflectively, be careful how you walk. Pay attention to the direction of your life, pay attention that you are paying attention to the things that are important. The second principle is redeeming your time. It says, be careful how you walk, making the most of every opportunity. In one translation, it says, making the best use of the time. Now, there are two words in the Greek for time. There is chronos and kairos. Chronos is chronology, it's the watch time, the passing of time, the hours and the days. Kairos is the opportune time, so it's translated, make the most of your opportunities. My brothers and sisters, there are God-given opportunities. And we are to steward these opportunities. Notice the emphasis of the Apostle Paul. He says, making the best use of your time, the kairos opportunities. And in another translation, it says, making the most of every opportunity. Now, when he says make the most of every opportunity, it tells us that the opportunities are precious. Don't waste it. Make the most of every opportunity because each opportunity from God is precious. Make the most of it. That's the emphasis. Be sensitive to the opportunities God gives you and make the most of these opportunities. Then it says, do it because the days are evil. Now, what's the connection? What's the connection between making the most of every opportunity and then it says, because, here's the reason, the days are evil. Think for a moment. How do you connect the two thoughts? Make the most of your time, translated, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. How do you connect the two? Here's how I understand it. Make the most of every opportunity because the opportunities can be lost in the days that are evil. There are God-given opportunities. They are good opportunities. But if we don't steward them, these opportunities can be lost because we live in evil days. Because we live on days of derailment, days of destruct, uh, de what, derailment and distraction. They are days of destruction. Don't miss or waste these opportunities. By the wisdom of God, that's why it says the contrast here, don't be foolish, don't be unwise, but be wise. By the wisdom of God, capture these opportunities God has given to you in how you and I use our time. In every life, there are three seasons. If you live a full life, you will find them in three seasons. Some lives are cut short because life is uncertain. But by and large, whether we live a full life, 
there, are, there is a book called Half Time. It tells us life is divided into two portions. I give you an alternative view. I like that idea, but here's the alternative view. I see life in three seasons, three portions, three parts. From birth to 30 years old, these are the discovery years. Childhood is a discovery year. Youth is a discovery year. Young adult discovery years. These are the things, time of season, before you are 30, learn as much as you can because it will help you for the rest of your life. These are the discovery years. How many of you are below 30? Can I see your hands? 30 and below. Oh, you are in a wonderful adventure of life. It's a discovery season. It's a learning season. Read, grow, have deep conversations and dialogues. Develop your growth, your development. Discovery years. From 30 onwards to 60, these are the defining years. Because from 30 to 60 years old, this is where your energy is. This is where your vital contribution is. This is where you are able to take your learning and grow with the experience. And most leaders in our world today are in this second season. They are in the season of their 30 to 60 years old. Young enough to have the energy, old enough to have the knowledge and the experience. Wonderful years. Can I see who's between 30 to 60, please? Many of you. In your defining years, pray for vital contribution, stewardship of your gift, because these are your contributing years. It doesn't mean if you're younger, you can't contribute, but the emphasis of the younger is keep on learning as you contribute, so that when you're 30 to 60, wow, these are your vital contribution years. There's a third season. And the third season is those who are 60 and above. How many of you are 60 and above? Can I see your hands? Ha <laughs> ha, these are my age group, senior citizens. When we come to that season, it's not just the discovery years or the defining years. Listen now, it's a very beautiful word. These are the deepening years. Yeah. Your life is being deepened by God. They are the years you leave a legacy, a worthwhile legacy. They are the years with experience. They are the years there's not sunset years going somewhere over the horizon and die. Right? You hear a statement like, oh, everything belongs to the next generation and the older ones are the past generation. They are the old generation. I want you to know those of you who are 60 and above. You are not the past generation. You are the now generation. It's the deepening years. You have a lot to contribute. And, and so if you are in that season of your life, pray for a worthwhile legacy. When my grandfather was in that season of his life, he wakes up every morning at five o'clock and he prays for each of his grandchildren. I'm one of his grandsons. And my grandpa said to me, when just a few months before he passed away, he held my hand and he said, every day, grandson, every day I pray for you. And every week I fast for you. And I tell Jesus, Lord Jesus, this is my little boy, my naughty boy. That's what my grandfather said. This is my naughty boy. Lord Jesus, please have mercy on him and use him. And today when I see God using me by his grace, it is an answer to an old man's prayer. Oh, people of God, if you're in that season of life, don't hanker after, oh, I want to do big things or great things like the younger ones. No, these are the deepening years where you live a worthwhile legacy. Make the most of your opportunities. You examine your life and you redeem your time. And to do so, you don't take today for granted. Why? Because the past is gone. The future is not yet arrived. You only have the present. 
there's a sundown where the shadow of the sun or the sun casting the shadow on the sundown tells the time. And these are the words that were being engraved on the sundown. It says, the shadow of my finger cast divides the future from the past. Before it is the unborn hour in darkness and beyond thy power. Behind is unreturning line, the vanished hour no longer dying. One hour alone is in your hand, the now on which the shadow stands. One hour alone is in your hands, the now on which the shadow stands. The, the essential truth in this poem is that we cannot capture the future or the past. The past is already gone. The future has not yet arrived. Only the present, here and now, is in our hands and in our stewardship. Use today well. You cannot change the past. It's already gone. Today, I want to give you the secret of how you can change the past. You imagine you are transported five years into the future. If you are transported five years into the future, what is today? Today is the past. Listen to this secret. It's simple. If you use today well, and every day else, you use today well, today well, in the next five years, by the time you enter five years into the future, all this today you have used well become your past, and your past is beautiful. Today, you cannot change your past as of yesterday, I can't do it, but I can control today, meaning I can steward today, I can use today well, and when I use today well, and tomorrow I say today, I will use it well, and day after day I use it well, one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, all the todays cumulatively become a redeemed past. Use it well. The third principle, determining your purpose. What's the purpose of life? The Apostle Paul tells us, understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5, 17. Now the word understand is an interesting word. The Greek word for it is to see the big picture and to put the pieces together. So when you put the pieces together, you are able to connect the dots and you're able to see the big picture. This is what we need to do. Sunni Imi, the idea of understanding, connecting the dots, seeing the big picture so that I can understand the will of God. The wise will make the will of God the purpose. The foolish will make my will the purpose. The problem with my will is I can't see the future. I don't know the future. But God not only knows the future, He holds the future. He commands the future. So He knows what is best for you and I. So if we are wise, we will lean upon Him who knows the future and holds the future and commands our destiny. So understand the will of the Lord. Walk in the will of the Lord. Now there are many things we can say about the will of the Lord. I want to tell you four simple things. The first, God's will is totally sovereign. Second, it is gloriously redemptive. Third, it is sometimes puzzling. puzzling. But fourth, it is always perfect. Put that together. God's will is totally sovereign, gloriously redemptive, sometimes puzzling, but always perfect. That is why the wise will walk in the will of the Lord. Because it redeems us, it empowers us, it inspires us, and it transforms us as we walk step by step in His will. Problem is, Many Christians want to know the will of God, but very few want to do the will of God. 
we walk with the sense, Lord, you help me understand and do because that's the purpose of my life to fulfill the will of the Father. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge is the reason why many Christians don't really want to do God's will. It's almost like, God, I want to know your will. Show me your will. Then I decide whether I want to do or not. The reason why many Christians think that is because our life is not anchored upon foundational truth. I taught that in IDC and the Lord lay upon me this principle He wants me to teach in every platform I have. So let me reiterate this principle for you because it's an important one. I begin this year praying for revival and the Lord laid upon my heart what is the diagnostic problem with discipleship in the global church today? And the basic problem is this. We know that the foundation of our faith is the Word of God. We should base our, our faith, our discipleship upon God's Word because His Word is truth. His Word speaks of ultimate reality. His Word guides and comforts us. His Word empowers us. The Word of God is powerful. We know we must build it upon the Word. And when we build it upon the Word, it means we have a biblical foundation, theological rootedness, and a Christian worldview. That's what we should do, base it upon the Word of God. Now, here's the problem. In living our life existentially, we are faced with three realities. We are faced with our pursuits, our pains, and our pleasure. Our pursuits is what we seek after. Our pains are the trials or the hurts or the disappointments of life or the challenges and difficulties. It could be health concern, financial concern, career concern, family concern, relational concern. But all these concerns come as the trials of life. Our pleasure has to do with the temptations of life and the temptations of this world. So faced with these three existential realities, our pursuits, our trials, which is our pain and our pleasures, suddenly, instead of basing it upon the Word of God, our cognitive lens kick in. What's our cognitive lens? Our cognitive lens is the way we see things. And the cognitive lenses is not our eyesight, it's our mind sight. It's our assumptions, our presuppositions, our proclivities what we are inclined to. And this impacts our feelings. Our feelings impact our choices, how we walk. And so when you put this tree together, our mind sight, our cognitive lenses, our feelings and our choices, because our choices are made by our feelings, our feelings is made by our perception. This fossilizes into our core belief system. Now here's the problem. Suddenly, there are two belief systems, two operating systems in one life. There is the Word of God and there is my own mindset, my own thinking, my own belief system. Just as no computer can operate on two, beliefs, uh, two operating systems or no mobile phone can operate on two operating systems, the human soul cannot operate on two core belief systems. We have a problem. So what do we do with this problem? We come to church and we walk in discipleship. We say we have this struggle. What do we do? The word, the world in us. Well, there are three options Christians take. Number one, they give up the word. They take the word of God, they throw it away. I, I backslide. I have nothing to do with the word. It's impossible. It's unrealistic. I want to live my way. So we backslide. We ignore the word of God. The second option is repentance. We come to say, sorry, Lord, I struggle, but I want your word to be the authority of my life. Please help me, Lord. And so we re-engage in that biblical worldview. We re-engage in that biblical foundation, the theological rootedness of knowing God, who God is, and the unchanging principles by which God deals with us, His truth, his wisdom, His will. And when we do that, we are empowered to live the Christian life. But here's the problem. In many parts of the global church, there are many Christians 
who have not chosen to walk away, they have not chosen to repent, then how do they operate with two operating systems in them? They give lip service to one while they operate on the other. So they give lip service to the Word of God. They, they attend church. They might even attend a small group or a discipleship conference. They give lip service to the Word of God, but their lives, the di trajectory, direction of their lives, the decisions they make, their behavior, their conduct is all governed by their own operating system. They're fossilized as their core values. In other words, they are putting on a mask. I mean, we Christians don't want to put on a mask, but we don't realize when we pay lip service to the Word of God and don't follow it, we are putting on a mask. And as a result, we live a compromised life. We don't understand the will of God. The will of God is for us to be transformed by the power of the gospel, transformed by the love of Christ, transformed by the grace of God. We no longer live an intentional life. We live a real, distracted one. So you may ask me, okay, pastor, what's the key then? What's the key to help us to come in repentance, to live an empowered Christian life? The Apostle Paul did not leave us to guess. He gives us the key in the very next verse, in verse 18. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Do not be unwise or foolish. Be filled with the Spirit. That's the answer. The answer is not my determination, my strength, my wisdom. The answer of living a life that is centered in God through His Word is when we are filled with the Spirit of the living God. Question, how do we understand the filling of the Holy Spirit? Look at the text. It's in the present imperative. The verb, be filled with the Spirit, is in the present imperative. In other words, it's a command. You must be filled by the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to live the Christian life without the filling of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to be a disciple of Christ without the filling of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to make disciples without the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's a command. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's a present command, present imperative, translated, you must keep on being filled by the Holy Spirit. It's a continuous sense. It's a day-by-day -day discipleship. And so as I was praying to the Lord, the Lord reminded me. He says three things are daily. Number one, discipleship is daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Number two, spiritual warfare is daily. And number three, the filling of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God can be a daily thing as we surrender and submit to Him. Be filled with the Spirit day by day. And then we realize the third thing is not just a command and a continuous command. You must continually be filled with the Spirit the third thing we realize is that this command doesn't mean I have more of the Spirit. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm now empty of the Spirit or I'm only half filled of the Spirit. I need to be filled with the Spirit. So I take up my cap and then I say, Lord, fill me with the Spirit like going to the patrol tank and say, Lord, top it up, top it up. It doesn't happen that way. Why? Because the filling of the Spirit is not how much I have of the Holy Spirit, it's the reverse. It's how much the Holy Spirit have of me. How much I'm surrendered to the Holy Spirit. How much I'm guided by the Holy Spirit. How much I'm led by the Holy Spirit. How much I'm being filled with the Spirit. The key to the Christian life, the key to discipleship, the key to to walking in that empowerment in our life is through the filling of the Holy Spirit. How? When we surrender our life to Him. 
Lord, I give you my life. Live through me. Help me. Guide me. Give me understanding. Give me strength. A simple prayer you can pray as an application is to pray for wisdom and strength. Lord, give me the wisdom to know what to do and the strength to be able to do that. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Oh, my beloved brothers and sisters, don't waste your life. Live it intentionally under God. Four basic principles. Examining your life, redeeming your time, determining your purpose, and embracing the priority of being spirit-filled, spirit-led. And when we're able to do this, we're able to be guided to live an intentional life under God because our life is short, because Jesus is coming again. Don't play games with God. Mean business with God. And that's what I encourage you this Sunday morning or this Sunday afternoon. Mean business with God. Live your life fully, intentionally. I'm going to close with a story I told in my discipleship conference many times. But the reason why I tell you this story again is to remind you how important it is to give it everything with God. It's a story of an American pastor by the name of Gus Bess. When he was in college, he played football. And they were in the final season, in the final game of the final season. In other words, whoever wins this game wins not just the match, they win the championship for the entire season. They win the last few minutes of this last match in this final season. Gus Bess says he turned around, he saw the football coming to him. He grabbed the football, spun around, and made a spectacular 20-yard dash to the touchdown. They celebrated him as the champion, the most valuable player in the game. And as they were throwing him upside down in celebration, the sports reporters came to interview him. They turned the mic to Gus Bess and said, Gus, in the last few minutes of the game, when you made that spectacular touchdown, what were you thinking? What went through your mind? And Gus Bess said, everything happened too fast to be thinking. I took the ball, and then as I spun around, Everything when I was spinning around was like in slow motion. My father was at the grandstand, he said. I couldn't hear what my father said, but I saw my father doing this and he was shouting. And in my mind, I hear my father say, run, son, run. And I ran with everything I've got and made that touchdown. Today, we are living not in the final minutes of a football game. We are living in the final days of world history. And we have in our hands something more precious than just a football. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ that's the power to change human destinies and human lives. And with that gospel in our hands, we hear the Father say to us, Run, son, run. Run, daughter, run. We got to run for the glory of God by living a life that is intentional because you and I have only one life to live. Run for the glory of God. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of the gospel to change our lives. And for those who have not known Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, the good news, the good news of knowing that Christ came to die for our sins, that believing in Him with newness of life, I pray now, Lord, would you speak to our hearts by faith. We believe, we receive Christ, we are forgiven and saved. My friends, if some of you have not yet made that personal decision to receive Christ, today I want to give you that opportunity and that invitation. Right now, right here, you say, Lord, 
Lord Jesus Christ, I surrender my life to you. I believe you as my Lord and Savior. If this is your desire right now, you have not received Christ before, but right now, this is your desire to live your life meaningfully, to take this opportunity God has given to you to respond by faith, to give your life to Jesus and live it intentionally. Right now, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you. Raise up your hand. Yes, God sees your hand. You have not done this before. Would you raise up your hand? Right now. Yes, God sees your hand. Because God sees your hand right now. Lord Jesus, come into my life and I want to live unto you. One last time, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I want to live my life intentionally for you, for your glory, for your purpose. Keep your hands high, let me pray for you. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, I pray for these ones, that the Lord Jesus will come into their lives, that they will live with power and grace and meaning and purpose. I thank you, Lord. You may put down your hands. I want to speak to the rest of you who are Christians. Don't waste your life. Live it for the glory of God. Run, son. Run. Run, daughter. Run for His glory. And if today you say, I hear the voice of God and I want to run for His glory and live an intentional life, if this is your desire, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you. Yes, yes. Many of you here, would you raise up your hand? As you surrender your life, don't play games with God, mean business with Him. Don't live a double life double loyalty, a double operating system in your life, it doesn't work. It doesn't give you true joy. Have that single eye, single devotion, single master, follow him and run for his glory. So one last time, if this is your desire, would you raise up your hand? I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for every hand that is being raised right now that you help us to live our life with intentionality, with purpose, with meaning, with power. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we have the wisdom and the strength. Wisdom to know your will. Wisdom to know what to do and the strength to be able to do it. We thank you in Jesus' magnificent name and the people of the Lord say, Amen. God bless you. Good day, CCF family. Welcome to this edition of Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real-life questions and we give you biblical truths. I am Pastor Eric Tatanias from Across Family Ministry, and we're here today, none other than our speaker, Reverend Edmund Chan, to answer some of your questions. Reverend Edmund Chan, thank you for that wonderful message. We have several questions for you. First question, how do you prioritize living for God amidst the competing demands and destructions of daily life, and what guiding principles do you use to help you in your decision-making process? Yeah. You see, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says we got to understand the will of the Father. What that means is to be able to connect the dots, see the larger picture, so that we don't get distracted or this real, derailed in life. I have learned that I need to make time to take stock of my life. And then I need to take charge of my life in order to live it intentionally and then take care of my life. It's about soul care because we'll always be distracted otherwise. But once we anchor in the Word of God and anchor in His guidance mm. to take stock of our life, take charge of our life, take care of our life, He guides us to be anchored in Him, to be rested in Him so that we can live intentionally. Amen, amen. Thank you, Dr. Edmund. Second question. How do you discern God's will and guidance in the decisions that you make, particularly in areas where there may not be clear biblical commands? The Bible itself gives us principles, even through the narratives. It tells us who God is and the unchanging ways by which He teaches us. It tells us of His character. It tells us of His truth. It tells us of the desire of our Father's heart. So when we come to a place where we don't find an explicit command, because there's no command that says, don't smoke. <laughs> yes. Uh, whether we can go bowling or not, or watch <laughs> movies or not. In those times, the key thing is what empowers us and what disempowers us. 
all things are lawful for us, but not all things are expedient. Mm. And so we have to find out in that sense, what are the things, even if they are lawful, they are legitimate, okay. that we are not compromised mm. by these things in our inner life. Mm. That it does not distract us or derail us, but rather anchor us in our love for the Father. Mm. So there was a Christian, for example, football is a big thing. And every Sunday is football, not church. Mm. Then he realized, no, I, football may be legitimate. Mm. It's, it's not a crime. Yeah. But the way he went about it, his priorities are wrong. So he reprioritized his life. We need to reprioritize it. Amen, amen. I like that. With that, we can be um, free from that legalistic mindset that this should be done this way. It's more about really getting intimate with God and knowing exactly what He desires for us for His ultimate glory. Thank you, Reverend Edmund Chan, for answering our questions. And that's it for CCF Sunday Fast Track.